Welcome to One Plus One. I'm Kurt Fernley. Kim in Lu loves Australian stories, and she's passionate about telling them on our screens. Recently, she was appointed head of content at Netflix Australia, but it's Q's story that we hear for today. It's a story about friendship, determination, grief, and love about being the daughter of Vietnamese refugees, losing her husband, and trying to shape the way that we see ourselves on TV. Kim Min Lu, welcome to One Plus One. Hi. You're a passionate storyteller. Where would you start your own story? Oh gosh, that is a big question. Um, was born in Redfern after a couple of weeks after my family um, were accepted as refugees and came into the country, and um, grew up in southwest Sydney. Um, watched a lot of TV as a kid, <laughs> and um, you know, uh, just tried to fit in as much as possible. That's where it starts, really. I think me, my mum two sisters, my dad, and uh, yeah, it was that for a while. Can you talk us through the process of how your parents would would get here? Um, so it was, you know, off the back of the, during the Vietnam War, um, my mother, my father, and my two older sisters, who were, you know, three and five at the time, got on a boat um, with a bunch of other people and escaped Vietnam and they were on the boat for about um, a month and happened to, you know, drift <laughs> um, into the Philippines and were taken in by um, people on shore and then spent, you know, almost a year in a refugee camp until uh, while they were applying to, you know, enter other countries, Australia being one of them, and um, we got accepted. Uh, we arrived in Australia and I was born not long after that. So, you know, my sisters always joke about me having slept through the whole thing, <laughs> which is, um, you know, true. <laughs> How does a boat drift into the Philippines? Why drift? There was a motor, but they were, they were boarded by pirates. And so the pirates pulled the um, motor out. And because my dad was ethnic Chinese, they let him go. So they were just cast adrift. And so it, it was through sheer luck. I mean, they could have just been drifting with no land in sight forever, but they luckily um, landed in the Philippines. What's the lasting impact on a family, that kind of experience, that kind of vulnerability, I guess? Yeah. Um, we don't really talk about it much. We're sort of, you know, stiff upper lip, get on with it people. and. If I ever, we didn't talk about emotional stuff, and, uh, but if I ever need money, a check will arrive. Like, it, that's, <laughs> that's uh, you know, we eat a lot and we make sure that we back each other up financially and that's kind of how it's done. And I, I think that's a fairly common um, thing culturally. So we never use the keyword, your trauma keywords or anything. We just uh, went to school. My mum worked her butt off. She just wanted us to study. Like, her main thing was, uh, just making sure that we were financially secure or would be financially secure. So it was mostly about pushing this, um, the importance of education and, and study and doing well and getting a job and buying a house and blah, blah, blah. Like all of that. Um, that's how it manifested, I guess, this desire to not be in that situation again. Like drawing a line underneath it to say that's done. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. Um, because, you know, you come into this country with nothing and you have to build everything up from scratch. You know, my mum worked two jobs. She was at Australia Post for like 30 odd years. She, you know, on her, on her, in her off hours, sewed clothes in a kind of backyard sweatshop scenario. I would help her by snipping threads off, you know, the many pockets she was sewing. She'd pay me $2 and... Um, but our, my job was to go to school and, and study. How would you describe that time in your childhood in South West Sydney? Uh, it was quite strict. 
and so I watched a lot of TV, <laughs> which is where I kind of got most of my social cues and, and cultural knowledge from. And I mostly worked on fitting in. So while there was quite a big Vietnamese community around us, um, my sisters and I were pretty, you know, Anglo-centric, I suppose. And I, um, with all the TV I watched, like what I saw on the TV was images or like symbols of what, um, you know, normal, normal family life should be. And it was, it was like a white nuclear family with two and a half kids. And so I spent a lot of time, even though I grew up in a very multicultural community, um, works pretty hard on blending in and, and fitting in. Um, so I, I would say that's how my childhood was marked. Um, under that theme. <laughs> and yeah. politically, it was a pretty turbulent time as well and challenging time, no doubt in... Well, yeah, because uh, particularly in the 90s, um, you know, there was, a, there was a heroin boom in Cabramatta and there was quite a stigma attached to being a Vietnamese person. Um, and so that made me want to kind of shift away further from it because of, um, of how the community was being demonised, you know, and it was it, it kind of capped off by Pauline, the, the, you know, introduction of Pauline Hanson and being swamped, the idea of being swamped by Asians and all of that. And my reaction to that made me want to assimilate even further and, like, that's how I dealt with it at that age. But unconsciously being aware that People didn't like you. People didn't like you? Well, yeah, you know, the prevalence of racism or whatever. I mean, it was there implicitly and in an everyday context, but there was just an awareness. Um, and sometimes it was, it was more external and overt, but that, you know, you, you weren't welcome. And we were trying to fit in. So, or I was anyway. So it's... You know, it's a weird, it's a weird place, space to be existing in, where you're you're trying to be accepted and knowing that you're not as well. So I grew up not really seeing people with disabilities on mm. TV. Or there, there was Professor Xavier in X Men, yeah. and <laughs> pretty cool, yeah. And there was uh, there was a, a, a Andrew in Heartbreak High, yeah. who was in a wheelchair. Yeah. Did you see people like yourself on TV when you're growing up? Look. Heartbreak High was a real moment for me as well because the Asian characters I saw on screen were always boat people who didn't speak English. But then seeing a character, I can't even remember his name, but uh, the character on Heartbreak High who was Vietnamese, I was like, oh, wow, he's, he has feelings and he has character development and, you know, he has a journey that he's going through. But that was a real turning point for me. Not consciously, but I think just being able to plant that seed was the start of something. I understand that we have something in common as well. Uh, is it true that you represented Australia in skipping? Did you represent Australia in skipping? <laughs> no, although I did skip. So when I, when I found out about that, for some reason when I was a kid, yeah. I had it in my head that I needed to learn to skip. Yeah. So I would line up next to my brother in my wheelchair and bunny hop my wheelchair while my brother oh, wow. did the robe and we would skip together. That's awesome. So you did so, go to a world championship? I did, it? yeah. I don't know how I landed there, but it, the, my skipping journey started with, um, in my early 20s, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I wasn't, it wasn't something I did from childhood, but I met a, a group of young women who I was loosely connected to and we had decided that we were going to start this jump rope, this double dutch group. We performed at Federation Square. We did the Adelaide Festival. We did all this stuff. Then we imploded. But I just <laughs> loved skipping. And we had recruited a pro who had read about us in the paper. We actually did an ABC um, promo back in, the t back in the day. That 
that's how I fell in love with it and met this pro skipper who said, you know, our team, the hip skips, is uh, going to compete in the world championships. I think you should join the team because we're actually missing a person. And I said, OK, that sounds like a, something I can do, fill a gap. And um, so I trained with them uh, for a while and then uh, went to the world championships in Talabudgera, <laughs> in, up in the Gold Coast. That's go. hilarious. We came 10th um, in the world, which is great, until I tell you that we, that we were, we were, it was 10 out of 10 groups. Look, so. I got ducks in my high school, um, <laughs> in my primary school. Yeah. Uh, there were, but there were two people <laughs> and equal ducks. But not everyone needs to know that. No, 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 no. So maybe edit that part out. Just, we came 10th in the world out of 10, but yes. How did you find your way to the arts? Um... As a, an avid TV watcher, as a kid, I just wanted to be in film or television or one of those things. Maybe it was some weird, you know, I must recreate what being a normal person is like on screen or something. Um, but I studied a media degree, which is not quite arts, so that was okay. I made films there, met some great people there and decided I would go into editing because it was a part of filmmaking that required using computers, which, which I thought I'd be able to get past my mum. And so, uh, you know, my, my motivation was really about being part of creating those images and symbols of what life was like. Again, I didn't think of it that way then, but I realised, you know, through lots of therapy, that's, that's kind of what it was. Um, and the way I worked my way into it without pissing my mum off too much um, was work with computers and become an editor, yeah. Can you tell me about uh, how you met your husband, Jesse? Beautiful, beautiful, meet cute story. We were both volunteers at FBI Radio in Sydney and I was producing the film show and he was producing an audio documentary show called All the Best that he had started with a, a few other people. And our shows were back to back, so I would meet, I would see, we would see each other in the producer booth as we crossed over um, on a Saturday morning. And that's how we met. And um, yeah, that's, it kind of spiralled from there. You would also have a, a child. Yeah. Alfie. Yeah. How, how did that, I don't know, how did that affect life? How did that change things? Um, yeah, it was interesting because Jess was a bit younger than I was and um, uh, he had sort of just figured out that by the time I was 35 I would probably want to have a kid and I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, really now? And he's like, well, you're 35. So we did it and I did not expect it to change my life as much as it did. Um, very naive, but uh, I found it quite hard. Just the just the shift in life, and I realise now as someone who is, you know, has ADHD, not a big deal, but, like, now I'm like, oh, that's why I found it so hard, because the reprogramming or reinventing and designing your entire life to be responsible for this other person was extremely unmooring and challenging for me. And so I, I struggled with it for a while. And uh, yeah, thankfully Jess was there because he, he, he can organise his way through <laughs> anything. Um, so he really carried a lot of it um, uh, during that time. But uh, that, was, that was year one of, of parenting. Oh yeah, never again. Six <laughs> weeks into it, we were like, let's never do this again. <laughs> um, yeah. It's almost like you prepare so much for that day of birth and then it's the... Yeah. I mean, I was like, most my biggest concern was like, how do I get this out of this? <laughs> and so... Big any, concern. Yeah, and so any, any reading I did was around that. What you did with the kid afterwards, I didn't really think about. I was just like, get it out! So... <laughs> um, uh, it, it, I, I was wholly unprepared. I don't think you can ever really be prepared until, it, you know, when, when it happens. But, uh, yeah, very naive of me. And there's all, well, like life, there's always something that pops up. Yeah. Jessie would become 
become ill. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk us through what that was? So, yeah, it's just before, like, as I was getting out of, you know, that first year of parenting and Alfie was about to turn one, um, Jesse checked on a lump in his leg and uh, one thing led to another and we realised that he had, well, we just, he was diagnosed with this very uh, rare sarcoma. Um, so he had this really rare cancer um, and that was uh, that adding that layer of of how what to do about it um on top of having a toddler was was um not an experience i would recommend um but yeah w he was diagnosed and he needed to have surgery to get the tumor out and then it was just the process of how do we of watching it and and making sure it didn't spread and which it did and, you know, trying to find different treatments for that and keep the home fires alive, have our careers, take care of a kid, you know, all of that stuff. It was, um, yeah, not ideal. When you're going through that, what do you, what do you use to get you through? Was humour ever in there? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a very Australian thing is just you always have to crack a joke in the middle of, of, of tough stuff, you know. When his um, tumour was taken out, we didn't know if he was going to have a leg or whether it, he would have a leg and it wasn't going to work or whether he'd be fine and we're like, okay, what happens now? Like we live three floors up in a, in a flat and how do we deal with that? Like, um, you know, what's that going to mean for your work? And actually, does this mean we can get a disability parking <laughs> permit? Like that would be pretty useful. <laughs> like we, we would always just, you know, there was always some gallows humour in it. My, my wife says she married me for the parking. <laughs> <laughs> it's, look, it's a very attractive, it's, it's, a, it's a very attractive thing. Um, you would, uh, Jesse would pass away. Yeah. Um, how long after would that happen? So that, it was about two years, two and a half years after, oof, just under two years, actually. After we, after we got the diagnosis. As a community, I don't know whether we deal with grief very well, mm. um, but how did you deal with grief? Uh, um, look, I had a very tight support network around me. Um, mostly you just, I, I mean, I was still having to take care of my kid and make sure he was okay and answer all the questions. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just about being as normal as possible, as regular as possible, while um, being carried basically by a group of really close friends. Um, so, you know, I mean, the first part was like, just organise the funeral. Like, how do you do that? What, what kind of stuff do you have to do when someone dies? Like, there's so much death, death admin that has to happen that, you don't really think about, um, and he did, you know, like a week before he died, he was like checking up on the passwords and making sure I had everything. And I was like, you know, you'll be here for 20 years. It'll be fine. And, um, I think he just understood what was, what was going on. So yeah, I mean, it was like, okay, I'm responsible for this, I suppose. Like what happens with the mortgage? It was, it was practical dealing with the grief. Um, and, uh, you know, lots of, lots of therapy. <laughs> <laughs> well, how important is it talking about that? Um, look, it, it's, it's, in, it's important. I think there's a, there is a way of approaching grief, which, um, tends to sweep it under the rug. And, uh, I try to talk about it as much as possible. Firstly, it's not a secret. Um, uh, Secondly, it helped to talk about him. Sorry. No, take your time. It's not something that stops. No. Okay, hang on. Sorry, I was starting again. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's, it, part of it is maintaining the routine, um, 
talking about it to whoever will listen. Um, and a lot of people had many, much patience for me during that time. But um, it's hard to find people who have gone through the same thing, particularly when you're kind of young. And I had, strangely, had read about this woman um, who had started up a, um, a club called the Hot Young Widow, Widows Club. And it was mostly North American, but it was a Facebook group that I could join. And so that helped me because, you know, the, the image of the widow or the widower that I was familiar with was, uh, you know, they were together for 40 years and, um, you know, he died and then she died with him and, like, you know, long-lasting love or, or someone figuring out how to carry on after, you know, very very, you know, some good innings together. And so uh, my experience was uh, not something I was familiar with. It's not something you see very often of, of spouses or partners passing away um, or dying, which is my preferred word, um, uh, when you'd, you'd barely started the journey. So... Yeah, it was, a, it was a good group of like-minded people. I didn't feel like talking, but it was just nice to be part of it in a, in a, in a place where you could crack a joke as well. <laughs> the tone of it was right for me. It was like there was a sense of humour about it. How hard was it to talk about grief with your child? Well, my kiddo was... He was two, and he... At that age, you they are able to compartmentalise the emotional and the practical side of things. So, you know, he was there throughout the hospital and the goodbye and the funeral and um, he understood that Dad had died and uh, the... It's not the most fun thing in the world, but it, my job was just to answer the questions. So. It was explaining um, and never uh, trying to deflect from the questions, um, repeating them as often as he needed and always being clear that Dad had died or Dad's body had died. We said goodbye. This is how it happened. And, you know, going through the photos whenever he wanted and des describing them and, and all of that. So. Going through that with him and, I mean, it always sucked when the photos ran out, but uh, just repeating it as much as you needed. You've, uh, you've made an effort to create modern, modern stories, stories that you wouldn't have seen as a kid. What are you most proud of creating so far on TV? Um, I've only really created one thing, <laughs> which was a show called The Heights, which was on ABC, and I created that with a friend and colleague, um, uh, Warren Clark, who, who was the showrunner of that show. And we didn't ever want to, you know, for want of a better phrase, like bang on about diversity with the show, but we wanted it to be, you know, the real Australia. Um, whatever that is, our interpretation was one that was like very multicultural, um, very inclusive, um, one that showed, you know, it was set in a, a public housing tower um, and that was surrounded by a rapidly gentrifying neighbourhood and it was like this, you know, what does the... Imagine, like, the upstairs-downstairs dynamic of Downton Abbey but in 2020, you know? Um, what does modern community look like now? And we, we wanted to show a world in which there were people from v all these different communities, different classes, living cheek by jowl, shoulder to shoulder, and, and finding more, more um, points of uh, commonality than difference. I'm really proud that there was like a cranky old Vietnamese woman character written into that show. That was like, <laughs> very important for me. It's very different. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, we wanted it to be able to do more than just tell a cracking good series of stories. So you, do, you don't want to bang on about uh, diversity yeah. when you were t talking about the show. Yeah. Is that because there is 
I feel like there's a pressure a lot of times with myself that, yeah. that when you go into a room, you are the one that will speak about diversity. You're diversity the, like, you're the mo model minority. Is that how you've, like, you're like, you're representing everyone? There are some times yeah. where you would just like to go in the room and just talk. Exactly, yeah. It's hard when you're in the minority to be like, I'm, I'm just me, I'm not, I'm not representing every single person from an underrepresented um, background, but like, that is how it feels like sometimes. What have you learned about yourself through your own story so far? I, okay, I have a real thing about, there's a theme in my life I think I've come to terms with recently, which is I have a real thing about being accepted or being part of a crew or being, you know, uh, or fitting in. And, and I'm, I've spent a lifetime being like, oh, do I fit in? Can I fit in? What do I have to do to fit in? Like whether or not it's, you know, in the dominant culture, in the industry, in the cool group or whatever. And so when I go to parties, I'm so socially anxious because I'm like, <laughs> God, you know, who's going to talk to me? Will I be accepted? But also, God, what if someone talks to me? You know, it's, it's uh, I'm constantly trying to figure out where I fit in. Um, that's the big theme. Your ability to create something that makes people feel like they belong seems to be the theme to me. Yeah, and I think that is something, not to say I've got all the answers, but yeah, I, I feel that a lot of TV up until now, particularly, you know, now that this pandemic pandemic has happened and everyone's had a really rough, you know, year, um, we have gone through so many stories on screen that are cynical or somehow like you know, a bit nihilistic in how they see the world, even the comedies. And when I look at shows that are, like it's really easy to be dark and dramatic because bad stuff happens to people, instant drama. What's really hard is making stories with heart and with humanity and empathy and with a sense of possibility. Like we, we are missing stories that activate people. We're missing stories that galvanise us or talk about like how we belong or how we might be able to find a way forward. Netflix sets you a challenge to, uh, to, to make it happen. And uh, as we look at what we're commissioning, what the team's commissioning, it's about where do we find those access points of connection and where do we leave people with a sense of possibility. So we're making our first reality show. It's called Byron Bays. It's about a group of extremely hot Instagram influencers who all live in Byron Bay. Um, you totally want to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's like a no brainer, right? And yes, it is a very good title. I came up with it and I took the rest of the day off when I did. I was like, <laughs> job done. But uh, what we're excited about is, you know, people love to kind of judge influences, right? Vacuous life, whatever, you know, Insta boyfriends, taking photos, fake, fake, fake. And what I would love our audiences to take away from it is a sense of, um, actually, don't we all kind of fake it online? Like, don't we all curate what photos we put online? Um, they're actually, we're actually a lot more connected to this group of people than we, than we perhaps thought at the start. And it's, it's acknowledging that Everyone has depth. Everyone has some kind of story. Um, and it's, it's embracing that rather than judging it. Kim and Luke, thanks for joining me on One Plus One. Thank you. You made me cry too. <laughs> well done.